Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. And uh, my name is Paul Spitzeri, uh, director at the Homestead. And as Jenny introduced us, we'll start off with John giving us some historical background on the Workman family and Mary Workman and explaining his own interests and how he got involved in the history of the family. So John, please go ahead. Thank, thanks, thanks, Paul. And uh, glad to see everybody here. To, to, I nearly said tonight, well, it is tonight for me. Can I just say straight away that the time in England is 10 p.m. It's dark outside, the temperature is just above freezing and uh, it's raining a little bit. <laughs> it's not very pleasant, unlike Los Angeles, no doubt. Um, can I just say also that I, I've lived here at Clifton in what used to be Westmoreland County, now Cumbria, uh, since the 1980s. I am a Cumbrian, so I know the county very well. I know Cumbria very well. I know Westmoreland, I think, as it was, and I know Clifton quite well. And some years ago now, about 25, 26 years ago, here at Clifton, I'd acquired quite a bit of knowledge about the local area, obviously, in the time I'd lived here, 10 years or so. And I was approached in at that time, in 1996 it was, by two uh, American gentlemen, uh, Judge David Workman of Los Angeles and his cousin, Judge uh, David Furman of uh, New Jersey. They had been researching their fascinating family background for a long time. And, um, but they'd got stuck with one or two items of it that they felt needed local knowledge at Clifton to sort out. They knew, I should emphasize that they knew their background was at Clifton, but they got into difficulties with one or two aspects. Um, they told me what they were very precisely, and after a bit of effort, I managed to solve them all. Uh, more by good luck than good management, perhaps, but I had the advantage over them, I should say, that I had the local knowledge. I knew where to look. I knew where to look for the answers to the things that were puzzling them, and uh, we, we eventually got it sorted out. Um, <clears throat> Mary, Mary Workman. Uh, Mary Workman was the youngest of a family of eight children of one Thomas Workman uh, of Clifton. Uh, his background was a, a long one in, in, this, uh, in this village and the area, uh, right back possibly to about the, the 15th, 16th century. So he, the, the family, Workman family, was very long established in this area and particularly at Clifton. Um, <clears throat> Mary, Mary was born in, uh, in uh, surprisingly, not at Clifton, but uh, a few uh, 30 miles away to the east in the county of Yorkshire at a place called Bounds. Now that's the first mystery. <laughs> I can't explain why it was that Mary, who spent all her life at Clifton, all but the first few months, uh, was born at Bounds in Yorkshire, uh, 30 miles east of Clifton, but she was. Uh, I never, never managed to sort that out, that out, but it doesn't matter. She was effectively uh, a Westmoreland Clifton girl, and she lived here for most of her life. Um, that, that's a, a, an item recording the uh, baptism of Mary, the daughter of Thomas and Lucy Workman, in 1808, June 26th, at Bowes in Yorkshire. Not Clifton, 30 miles away at Bowes in Yorkshire. How it came about, I don't know, but, it, but it's true. It's there in the record. Um, anyway, as, as I mentioned, most, most of Mary's life was lived here at Clifton, possibly from the age of about two. And that, in fact, is the house at Clifton in which Mary and the rest of the family lived throughout her lifetime. It was originally one house on its own, uh, but probably about 1840, uh, it was divided into two and about 15 feet was added at the top end. How that came about, I'm not sure again. But it made two quite uh, surprisingly comfortable houses from the one that had been there before. Can I say a little bit more about Clifton? Uh, it's it's a, a nondescript English village. It's not a little place with such cottages and whatnot. It's a working village uh, based on farming and various other trades. Uh, it's, it's, it, but all the houses are quite solid, uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century. And uh, this one is at least typical of them. In fact, it's probably the most substantial house in the village of Clifton. And that house was acquired by the father of Mary, who was Thomas Workman, and Thomas acquired it uh, through the generosity of a mater maternal uncle called David Harrison, who died at Clifton in 1794. And 
left him a lot of his property, or all, in fact, all of his property in the village and substantial funds besides. So Thomas Workman, um, originally a Clifton boy, but he'd been away from home for quite a long time, uh, came to that house in 1812. 1812, 1813, around about 1812, when Mary was very small, having been born in 1808. Um, th th that was their home here at Clifton, the workman family, uh, for a very long time. Uh, <clears throat> very substantial house, I, I would emphasize. Uh, a place that anybody would have been uh, proud of at the time. Can I just say that it might surprise some of you to know that it was probably built about 1720. So it's something like 300 years old. Uh, but still lived in by two families separately in each house and uh, still in, in, uh, in excellent order, maintained, brought up to date and, and whatnot uh, as necessary, uh, but a very, very substantial house. Um, Clifton, as I, and as I said, probably the best house in Clifton anyway, <laughs> to start with. Um, a quick history of Clifton. Uh, it's been here, the village, for a very long time. In fact, if you, if you go right back to Roman times, the Romans certainly knew this area well enough. And even before that, uh, it, it probably became fully established as a village in, the, uh, in medieval times. The name Clifton uh, is, a, is an, uh, an Anglo-Saxon sort of word, uh, which means a hill settlement, a hill settlement, probably from about the eighth or ninth century. So it's a, it's a very old village, still with a population uh, of, a, of a few hundred, just as it was when David and William Workman, the two original pioneers, left home uh, in 1822. Uh, it, it hasn't grown all that much. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the church is medieval, date uncertain, but it, it must be 12th, 13th century, undoubtedly. Farming is still as much of an occupation here as ever, but there are only one or two farms left, and most of the people use the village, I should think, as a dormitory for Penrith, two miles away where they work. Uh, it, Clifton, it, it, it has only one claim to fame. It's a very um, nondescript little village, really, in, in English terms. It's not a twee thatched cottage sort of place. And it's, it's only claim to fame, really, apart from being the, 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 big, the starting point of the working family, can I say, but it's, it's, it's only claim to fame in historical terms is that it was the scene of the last battle on English soil in 1745. Uh, no more than a skirmish, but it was quite a significant little back battle actually. The last time the two armies clashed on English soil happened at Clifton. That was nothing to do with the, the workman family, I might say, but it, it happened, the battle, which lasted an hour or two, happened within a mile or so of what was then the long-term uh, workman residence at a farm called Brown Howe about uh, two miles from the village center. So the workman family living there at that time, uh, forebears of Mary, would have known all about this terrible battle. A few were killed, uh, so it was, it, was, it was serious as far as they were concerned, but regarded as a skirmish now, the last battle on English soil. Anyway, 1745, nothing to do with the, nothing to do with the, the, the workman family. Um, the workman family then at Clifton, the workman family at Clifton, um, they, successive generations of workmen were successful people on the land at Clifton on a farm about a mile from this house that we're looking at uh, called Brown Howe. Uh, the, the records show, the manorial records show that Brown Howe was run by a workman right back to 1643. But unfortunately, I can't go further back than that because the records run out at that time. All I can say is that I'm convinced that this original record of, of a workman at Brown Howe Farm in 1643 undoubtedly uh, was not the first appearance of a workman uh, in farming in this village. It probably started well before that, if we knew when it was. Anyway, uh, workmen, successive generations of workmen uh, worked the farm at Brown Howe until the 1770s. Then something changed very dramatically at Brown Howe because um, the then head of the household died suddenly. He had to die suddenly because he left no will. 
uh, he left debts and, and people owing him one thing or another. It was a sudden, a sudden departure from this life. Uh, the fact that he left no will was the, the clue. He, he, it must have been a very sudden, unexpected event, whatever it was. By this time also, his son, his oldest son, Thomas, also called Thomas, who incidentally, this Thomas, this particular Thomas, would be the great, great grandfather of the two emigrants, William Workman and David, their great, great grandfather. Anyway, um, Thomas, this, this, this particular Thomas in the 1770s, left home when he was only 12 years old at Clifton. He moved about 100 miles to the east, to Newcastle on Tyne, or just above that, where he, he went into, into uh, well, he, he took a uh, residence with a learned clergyman who, in fact, was his uncle, the Reverend William Workman. The name William Workman again. The Reverend William was well established as a leading clergyman uh, north of Newcastle, just north of Newcastle, and by this time, and he took in the little boy aged uh, about 12 or 13, Thomas Workman. Surprisingly, I don't know what drove the boy to do that, but he did. And suffice it to say that Thomas, this young Thomas, only 12 when he went uh, to Newcastle, um, a few years later, was in London, central London, where he got married. He married in, in, uh, in, in the Strand, London, in 1789. And he, he still, as far as I know, had not been back to Clifton, but he came back to Clifton eventually when this uh, uncle that I think I mentioned, David Harrison, uh, left him uh, all his property in the village, including this house that we're looking at. David, David Harrison, the owner, a wealthy man, a lawyer, uh, left his uh, nephew, Thomas, Thomas Workman, this property and a lot of other property in the village. So all of a sudden, young Thomas Workman uh, became ex extremely well, oh, of course, pretty well off. Also, he spent this time in London where he started a family. He got married in 1789, he started a family. Two daughters, Agnes and, and Lucy, were born there. And he came back uh, to Westmoreland with the two children. Not at first to Clifton, can I say, but first of all, staying about three miles away at a village called Temple Sowerby, a rather strangely named place called Temple Sowerby. And he only moved back to Clifton in 1811, the Thomas Workman, with his family on the death of his mother, Agnes, who was the brother of the wealthy benefactor. Uh, his mother, Agnes, died at this house we're looking at in 1811. And at that point, uh, Thomas, with his family, came back and lived to Clifton and took up residence in that, that house that we were looking at on the screen, the rather well-to-do sort of place. Uh, so Thomas, uh, that was Thomas and Lucy's home from 1811. Uh, as I mentioned, I think Mary, young Mary, the youngest of the family, had been born in 1808 just a few miles from Clifton, 30 miles from Clifton. But she, along with the rest of the family, moved into residence in that house. And uh, anyway, um, can I say right away, can I say right away, before I go any further, that this, this Workman family that we're talking about, Thomas Workman, Lucy, his wife, and their children, were no ordinary family. <laughs> the more I've researched this, this Workman family, the more I've been convinced that it was no ordinary family. They certainly were not your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. <laughs> no doubt about that. They were an ex extraordinary family. And by the time that young Mary, the youngest of the family, our subject today, by the time that she was 14 in 1822, uh, her three of her siblings, a sister and her two brothers, were thousands of miles away in, in America. Uh, the sister, Agnes, left for the United States in 1820. Uh, David, by this time, the, the oldest of the two brothers, David was already in Missouri, having gone there about 1818. And William, <clears throat> his younger brother, left this house in June 1822, along with David. <laughs> David, of course, had gone four years ago to Missouri, but he came back four years later, astonishingly, all the way from Missouri, thousands of miles, 
to this house in order to collect his brother and also to collect a lot more cash between them. And the two brothers left that house in June 1822 uh, with what would have amounted to an enormous amount of cash between them, something like five or six hundred pounds added up. A tremendous amount, phenomenal amount. Uh, it would have bought up just about every property in the village at that time, having that inflation. So the two well, very wealthy young man, men left home. Not, not your huddled masses yearning to break free, as I said. Uh, and Mary then, as I say, was used to 14. Um, Mary's mother died at the house, at that house in 1830. And the, the build up to her death was a very sad time, obviously, for the family. And Mary uh, launched on her writing career effectively, as far as I know, uh, with a letter about the, men, the state of her mother. And she wrote that letter on January 1st, 1829. It's a quite remarkable letter. Uh, the phraseology is, I would have thought, that of, of a much more mature person than a, a young lady of 20. Anyway, she wrote, she wrote that letter um, to her brother, David, in, uh, in Franklin, Missouri. And a quite remarkable letter it is, I think, for a, a young lady at Clifton, in this obscure little village, who then was only 20 years old. Yours we duly received, and I'm happy to say we found my mother in a less infirm state than when I last wrote. But her disease is of a very critical nature. Quite, a, quite an astonishing letter, I think. Be assured that nothing, uh, for her sake, nothing has been wanting either on my part or my sister's to promote her perfect recovery. Your letter, that's, that's what she's saying to David, your letter was both a consolation and a trouble to her. She says that she can read it all, the breathings of an affectionate son, while at the same time, your prolonging her, your departure almost de deprives her of the hope of seeing you. <laughs> Quite a remarkable turn of phrase, I think, for a young Georgian lady in England at that time, only 20 years old. Astonishing. And the whole, the whole letter uh, relates to the anxiety in the family uh, about the health of mother and father and Mary's desire that her two errant brothers, David and William, should keep in touch and if possible, get back to Clifton while things are, uh, people are still alive. An unbelievably, uh, I think, uh, moving letter by a young lady to, to two errant brothers 4,000 miles away in the US. <clears throat> it also illustrates her amazing facility with a pen. Um, when, I, when, I, when Paul asked me to have a look at this, this, uh, this, these writings of, uh, of Mary, uh, he was rather hoping that I might be able to say how it was that a young lady living in, in a, a little village in England uh, right in the north east northwestern corner of England could possibly have had the uh, academic background to be able to write a letter like that. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I can't answer that. I can't. All I can say is that uh, I can speculate and say that whatever it was, uh, her academic ability, uh, Mary, that is, Mary's academic ability must have been recognized by some highly qualified person who was probably a clergyman. And he recognized her ability and her potential, and he, uh, ed uh, he um, pursued her education to the point where she reached, in English, what I would think was probably a degree standard now. Absolutely tremendous. I emphasize that this is a time when, in England, young ladies didn't usually have any education at all, even in families which could afford it. Uh, the view was taken, I suppose, well... <laughs> Why did young ladies have to be have to be educated? They just needed to be young ladies and do young ladies things. They didn't need to be educated. Money would not have been spent even in the most wealthy family on most young ladies in England in 1820. A great deal of trouble was taken educating uh, Mary Mary Workman for whatever reason, uh, and uh, an admirable one she did as well. She put there an admirable one indeed. Um, she was an absolutely uh, amazing uh, expert at writing the English language. Tremendous. Um, anyway, mother died, unfortunately. Mary's mother died, unfortunately, in 1830. Her father 
was then in declining health. I think she, she refers to a father here and says that um, father was, uh, was a shriveled old man. He would then have been about 65, her father. She refers to him as a shriveled, there, there we are, right in the middle of the letter. My father, who is now a shriveled old man, uh, 65, uh, but 65 in 1829 would be quite an old age, if I can put it that way. Uh, you wouldn't have got a young 65 year old in England in 1829. Uh, so Thomas is described by Mary and his daughter, youngest daughter, as a shriveled old man. <laughs> However, and Mary at this time was obviously very ill. She died the following year. Anyway, uh, um, I've tried every avenue I can think of to find out how it could possibly have been that a young lady call, called Mary Workman, living at this obscure little village in the north west corner of England, could possibly have had any education at all, let alone the ability to write a letter like that. And uh, I'm defeated, and I've got to speculate that it must have been the prolonged influence of a local clergyman who spent a lot of time with her to bring it to that standard. Um, of course, we're here tonight, not just to, or today, not just to look at Mary's writing ability, but also to what I think is even more amazing, and that is her ability as an artist. And I think that's where Paul's going to come in with, with some quite startling uh, material that shortly he'll be presenting to us. And again, I've wondered how she could possibly have done that. Uh, the quality of these things is, is quite astonishing. But I can only think that, again, it must have been the influence of a devout local clergyman who gave her every encouragement and helped her along the way. Also, a, a little bit of credit to, perhaps to a father who had lived when he was young with uh, that uncle that I think I mentioned uh, in Northumberland, the clergyman, a very learned clergyman at that, he, Thomas's uncle. So there might have been an influence there. But I think the local clergyman must have been the, the key to how she managed to do it. Can I, can I ask Paul that, uh, <clears throat> that you uh, have a look at her, that we have a look at uh, our, um, her artwork? Great, will do. Thank you, John, very much for the introduction and the background. And hopefully all of you get an appreciation for, like John said, just how remarkable the story is. Uh, not just Mary, but her two brothers and an older sister who also went to the United States at a time when most people didn't get all that far from where they were born. And when John was referring to the letters, you know, some of the other ones that we have transcriptions of, we haven't seen originals yet, but uh, how she talks about family members and shows concern for uh, the family, both in England as well as in the United States, wanting to see her uh, brothers again that sort of thing. Uh, this is an 1835 letter where she uh, basically, she's writing to David and William, both brothers, hoping that one's gonna pass the letter on to the other, but she chastises William, calling him my bonnie boy, saying you've lived a little longer in this great world than I have, but you probably haven't explored the minds of men so much as the outside of the globe, and you can't be without tenderness, or the idea that tenderness begets tenderness, uh, that sort of thing. It's, it is pretty, pretty astonishing to see how she expresses herself. Uh, talks to her older brothers. I think it's worth remembering too. She was only about nine or ten years old when her when her brother David left, and, and about fourteen when William left. So she didn't get to enjoy their company as an adult, and that might have had an influence in this. It's always neat to see things like the censuses. This is the 1841, which John explained to us uh, yesterday was the first that listed names of people. Uh, in the British census. So here at the bottom, we have Thomas, um, the one son who remained in England, uh, uh, also named Thomas, uh, an older sister, Lucy, and finally Mary with the household servant, Margaret Bell. Later letters, uh, very uh, interesting again, talking about the, the connections of family, uh, also talking about the fact that there was a new addition to the house, which John had, had referred to earlier, and that they were renting uh, part of the house out to a gentleman uh, at that point. So it's it's really good to have what you can get from these kinds of material because it's, a lot of us may know sometimes these things don't last over the generations. And one of the things that uh, did transpire in 1884 when the last of the children in England, Thomas, who had been confined to a, an asylum 
because of mental health issues. When he died, one of the workmen from Los Angeles traveled out to Clifton to close the estate down and then brought back the letters, the artwork we're going to show, and some other material. So we're thankful to have that even survive from 1884 to the present here in Los Angeles. 1851 census is also interesting. Mary is, is the head of the household, and that may well be because her brother Thomas was not in a mental condition or state to do that. The title proprietor of houses and land, uh, I asked John about that, if that was considered an elevated status, and he said certainly would be. Uh, you've got blacksmiths and a grocer and a baker and retired innkeeper. So as John indicated, these were folks that had a, a standing economically and socially that would be different. The census also does show that William did travel back to Clifton for his only return visit home. He had just arrived maybe 10 days prior to the census being taken at the end of March. And so that's pretty neat to see him there and the same servant we saw 10 years before. And then with the letters, I'm gonna end here with a later one from 1856 from Mary to William. This was uh, an interesting one for a bunch of reasons, uh, including the death of David, uh, one of the brothers who had come to the United States first. David had died in 1855. There was a funeral at the cemetery that we have at the homestead, El Campo Santo. And it was covered in the Los Angeles Star newspaper. So William enclosed a clipping of that article, which by the way, is one of the first in Los Angeles to even describe a funeral, which makes it historic in its own. But at the bottom of the first page, he talks about moral pieces drawn from life that she was getting ready for the press. And she says, I've never published anything since those little works during your short, short sojourn with us, which be, would be 1851. But as John said, even the idea of, of being educated, much less publishing something, women were not supposed to be professional writers and that sort of thing in the minds of many people. And so it really made her stand out. And at the top of the second page, she says she had a spiritual piece or rather a work that she wanted to dedicate to William. And if time allowed, she would print it in letters with her pen in a certain style. And you'll get an indication of what she was talking about. And she said, if it could reach your hands as well as a handsome portrait, which she had not quite finished. I have not seen that. Uh, maybe it has survived, uh, maybe it never got done, who knows, but it'd be great if we could uh, see if that uh, portrait would, would have been finished and sent over to Los Angeles. So this gives you a little bit of, of the transition from her talking about some of the work that she did to this rather remarkable artwork. These were donated to the museum just a few months ago by John and Lane Krebs, who are descendants of Elijah Workman member of the family who traveled back to England in 1884 to close the estate. And we were really surprised to see the quality of this because when you think, oh, someone's going to send some artwork down, you could have different opinions or, or viewpoints of what that might look like. But these are really exceptional. The one you're seeing here is, is based on the, the biblical tale of the prodigal son. It is a large framed work. It is also multimedia. There's a variety of types here. This, the clothing, for example, is applique, um, rich sort of um, burgundy color and powder blue and, and navy blue. There is almost like gold leafing uh, here on the bottom around some of the verses that come out of the prodigal son story as, as well as some of the details. Uh, just really, really amazing work here. I'll show you a couple of details where you can actually see how that fabric is applied over the top of the painted work that she did. Just, just really incredible. Even the, the level of detail that she would use to, to do the hair, uh, the, the lines in the hands, just the anatomical detail is pretty impressive. Similarly, some of these other details where again, you can see some of the uh, applied uh, gold leafing or whatever this material happens to be, it's framed. And so we can't get in there and, and get a better look at that. Uh, may, may have an expert take a look at this and see what they can determine. And then her, her calligraphy and writing just fitted in in all kinds of places. It's, it, it's really a pretty impressive piece of work. There's also a portfolio that is not on its face very impressive looking. It's probably about maybe six by nine inches, seven by 10 inches, something like that. Uh, hard cover, sort of marbled uh, cover to it. But on the inside, it, there's just a, a wealth of detail uh, of not just artwork, but also religious meditations, copies of poems, sermons, what have you. 
that really reveal a lot about her as an individual, much less her ability as an artist uh, and illustrator. The first page shows guardian angels. Some of the pages have terrors and missing sections and all that. It's just pretty remarkable overall that this has survived 185 years or so. But uh, this is a good illustration of some of the, the detail that she did. You can see with the, the halos and what have you, there's the application of uh, a white ink, something like that. Very nicely done. A good example of some of the uh, copies that she did, religious meditations. Alexander Pope was a very famous uh, poet of his day. Um, quotations of his are, are still used in the English language. And so the dying Christian to his soul, she, she took some of the verses from that, uh, wrote that out. So not all of these have the, 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 the paintings or the intricate drawings. Some of them are, and there's a little bit of, you can see the, the calligraphy effect here. Edward Young, not a name that many people know today, did a, a long form poem called The Complaint in the 1740s, but the illustrator was William Blake, who remains pretty famous. And then Mary wrote this out and did some of the, the drawings in March, 1844. So the, the range of dates here is 1836 to 1844. This is faith and reasons. So again, another religious expli uh, explication. Yes, John. Sorry, sorry to put in. That, of course, is just after the death of her father, isn't it? Uh, That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah father, quite a bit of the work comes after that. Yeah. She, her father died 1843, of course. Yeah. In fact, we'll see probably a really good illustration of what the father's death meant uh, to her personally. And this will be here, in fact. Uh, it, it really remarkable, small painting. You can see the angels looking through the clouds. There's a man on his deathbed. Uh, with family grieving nearby, a, a member of the clergy there. And this is March 1844. So, John, I wonder if this is her reflecting upon the death of her father, not all that long before, probably within several months. Yep. And she quotes from a, a female poet. There weren't very many of these that were well known. Jane Taylor was one, her poem, The World in the Heart. This is a, an excerpt that she put at the bottom of this painting. So pretty impressive to see again her, her sources as well as her own work that she is putting into this. Uh, another adaptation of a hymn from a guy named Augustus Toplady, one of the more interesting surnames that I've come across uh, lately. But uh, and again, she wouldn't necessarily quote entire works. She would take a, a few of the, of the phrases uh, out of these works and then replicate them in her, in her portfolio. One of the more detailed ones here, uh, she is quoting from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is Christmas 1843. So again, not long after her father passed away, as John indicated before. But you can see, again, not just the, the, the writing, but also the calligraphy effect and the, the artwork that goes along with that. And I'll show you another detail here uh, close up of what's going on. And again, she's referring to, uh, of course, the birth of Christ and, and uh, the, the crucifixion and, and agony and all that. Just amazing uh, replication of all this stuff. William Romaine, another uh, well-known uh, member of the clergy, had a very long sermon, uh, The Believer's Triumph Over Death. Uh, there were several versions of this that had been put out. In other words, that title was used uh, by others. But she wrote this out over three pages. So clearly important to her to meditate upon. This is not dated, but I wonder again, was this done shortly after the passing of her father, Thomas? William Ellery Channing was an American. And so this is another interesting aspect. Everybody else she sourced in this portfolio was British, except for Channing, who was a Unitarian minister. Uh, in other words, Unitarians believed that it was one figure. That you didn't have the Trinity, in other words. And so she is pulling from different traditions as well. Pope, for example, was a Catholic. Uh, there's another uh, work that I'll share in a moment that also comes out of a Catholic convent. So uh, she seems to have a very strong spiritual element. This is a romantic period, so-called uh, poets and religious uh, figures and what have you. And so she's definitely part of an established uh, way of thinking and doing things in England during this time. Channing's work came out in the early 1830s. And then she's replicating this again at Christmas, 1843. And the detail here at the top. So you can see uh, angels among the clouds and, and uh, the Lamb of God above the cross. Very intricate work here. 
This uh, stood alone, uh, didn't have any text or explanation to it, doesn't really need to. Of course, it is, a, it is about the crucifixion and, and agony of Christ. Unfortunately, you're going to have damage to pieces this old. Uh, this is basically uh, pasted down into the book, but look at the richness of the purple on the robe there, the details, uh, you can see the rib cage showing and uh, the, the, the throat and uh, the way the hand is, is rendered very well done artistically. And as John indicated, she had to have had um, training or encouragement at least from somebody, whether it was a you know, clergyman as John indicated more likely than not. She had her own meditations. I don't think she copied this from anybody. I wasn't able to find anything that would show that, but she titled this in reading the New Testament. And again, went at length talking about her, her viewpoints of things from a religious standpoint. Paul? Yes. Uh, we had a question um, from Sunny asking if they are, what kind of materials was she working in? Was that an oil painting, uh, the crucifixion image in particular? It's hard to tell. Some of it looks like it could almost be a uh, watercolor. Some of it looks like it might be sort of a pen and ink or it, I'd have to have somebody professional look at it because it's not something that I am particularly well versed in. But even the use of the applique and other materials is interesting as well. So that's something we can definitely uh, have someone look at that has familiarity with uh, the, the types of materials that would be used. And again, perhaps another reflection, as we were discussing earlier, after her father's death, this is again the Christmas season of 1843, and she wrote a meditation on childhood. I was not able to find that this was excerpted from somebody else. It appears to me that this is something that she wrote, but she talks about how life can be tough. And of course, we, we know that at that time, it might have been tougher because people didn't live as long. There were diseases. Um, all, all the things that they had to deal with that we necessarily don't have to, but also, again, having lost her mother and father and most of her siblings having left as well. She talks about reality, rough, stern reality, world cold, hard of the world, uh, sad experience, somber truths, uh, withering sneers should scare those gentle spirits from their holy temple. It's, it's just really pretty remarkable what she's writing down here. And again, perhaps in grief and mourning. And so to Sunny's question, it, it's, if you look at the background here, it almost looks like it might've been done with sort of a watercolor effect, but it, again, we'd have to get somebody to really take a look at this and see if that's you know, maybe a, a combination of things, uh, pencil or whatever there, there may have been available to her. This is part of the, the childhood page of the book. She did often indicate in a corner usually or somewhere in the text, her name and the season, but some of these pieces are undated. And again, beautiful work, uh, mother and child. So who knows that she's reflecting on her own uh, mother who had died 13 years prior. Nathaniel Cotton uh, wrote a work called The Fireside and she quotes extensively with this too. This is not so much a religious work, although it, it has that element to it as it is about family. And so she writes, I believe, the entire poem on this one page. And then next to that, she has another striking uh, illustration here of uh, family by the fireside. You look at the father's face, he looks pretty content. And he's got his wife and uh, presumably four children. The young man is reading, which I thought was interesting, John, in terms of the young girl here is playing with a doll. So it kind of goes to perhaps what you were saying that girls were not usually educated. It was usually the, the, the boys who were but a really beautiful little domestic scene, uh, reflective also of some of the works that she drew from Psalms, uh, chapter 127, a couple of the verses or portions of that. And then a section from John Milton's Paradise Lost, you know, one of the more famous uh, poems in English language. She did this in March, 1844. So again, it's not all that far removed from uh, her father's death. Paul? Yes. Uh, another question is how large are some of these works? Well, the, the, the portfolio is pretty small. As I said, it's, it's, the pages are not letter size. I'm thinking they're along the lines of six by nine or something like that. So uh, something like this is, is just a, almost like a card, maybe three by four inches, something like that. So to get to the detail 
uh, at, at a size like that, where you're working with almost like miniature, is is definitely worth mentioning. So it's a good question because it gives you an idea of, of sense of scale. Another work that was quoted, Nicholas Michel, uh, 1830s, uh, Ladhern Convent, which is in southwestern England, I believe, and uh, Catholic um, in this case. But again, she's drawing from things that are just religious in general, Christian in general, and uh, utilizing that. This is January 14th, 1844, uh, again, in close proximity to what we've talked about already. And, uh, and some of these uh, words, you, you again, you think about whether uh, or, or how directly connected these are to her personal uh, viewpoints of things. Uh, it, it starts off, though public wheel condemns conventional life that sinks the friend, the mother, and the wife and breaks society's electric chain from heart to heart, conducting joy and pain. So definitely gives you the impression that she is working her way through uh, what we would probably call the 12 stages of grief today. Towards the end, we see a, a wonderful work here, um, I'm assuming, uh, Virgin Mary, it's not identified as such. There is some quotation from a very long poem called Agatha by Letitia Elizabeth Landon, another uh, young woman, the name's not recognized today necessarily, but she was quite well known. In fact, I think she was called the Lady Byron uh, Lord Byron being one of the most famous British poets of the early 19th century. Uh, Landon had kind of a sad life, didn't live much uh, after this particular poem was published. He died within a few years. But clearly Mary Warpin had access. And that's another interesting question. How did she come across all of this? Uh, some of these would be published in magazines. And so she may have been able to subscribe to or find these magazines in her little village and then be able to use them as part of uh, her work. And um, I, I meant to say a couple more things about uh, some of the poems there. Uh, Jane Taylor was another one that she had quoted. Um, Taylor is best recognized for being the author of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, which is a little interesting tidbit. But the idea that she was drawing from women and men uh, from different religious uh, groups and, and really emphasizing spirituality, as well as thinking about the timing of when a lot of this is done uh, and working through grief and mourning is something that is pretty, pretty interesting to ponder. So hopefully with John's explanation of the background of the family and of, of Mary's own background, and then getting a chance to look at uh, some of this artwork, you've gotten a good sense of just how unusual this story is and how impressive Mary Workman was as an individual to the extent that we can know her through her, her letters, uh, her writings and her artwork. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to, to Jenny. And if there's any other questions, of course, uh, please let us know. But again, thank you very much. And before I do that, actually, let me mention upcoming events we have. We have uh, four more uh, for, during the, the rest of this year. A nonfiction book club is meeting at the beginning of December to talk about Scott Bottles' his book, Los Angeles and the Automobile, The Making of the Modern City. Scott worked for a long time for the uh, Auto Club of, of um, uh, here in Los Angeles. We have a, a Homestead Holiday Open House on Sunday, December 5th from noon to 4 p.m. where people can walk through the first floor of La Casa Nueva and see the decorations. The flyer here is here on the left. And we'll have short tours of the second floor and also the Workman House as part of that. This is Sunday, December 5th, noon to 4 p.m. Sunday after that, we have a program called Holiday Spirits, where we will have uh, staff members. Danny is part of that, Robert Barron, who is our facilities coordinator. And they'll be uh, talking about um, treats and spirits, meaning beverages that could be mentioned in songs and stories of the season. So that's Sunday, December 12th, 2 to 3.30, virtual only. So the open house is in person, obviously, and the spirits program is virtual. And finally, our fiction book club will be concluding this year with uh, Utopia series and uh, Nathaniel Hawth Hawthorne's 1850s, The Blythdale Romance. That's Wednesday, December 15th from seven to nine. Please follow us on social media at Homestead Museum. We are very active on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can learn more about the family's history as well through our website, homesteadmuseum.org and the blog, homesteadmuseum.blog. 
So uh, with that, thanks again for joining us. Have a happy Thanksgiving. If there are any more questions or comments, please let us know. Okay, Jenny, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, so Sunny said it's really nice to have her portfolio and thank you so much for taking us back to her time. And thank you, John, so much for being here and she hopes everyone has a good Thanksgiving. I'm just gonna take another quick look here, see if there's any other questions, comments. I should mention too, Jenny, before we uh, end this, that the, the name Mary is pretty common, but there are descendants who have carried that name. Uh, Mary Julia Workman, who was a great niece of, uh, of Mary Workman's, very active in uh, social causes, uh, education, uh, settlement houses for immigrants and all that through much of the early 20th century. And uh, there's a Mary Workman who lives in the San Gabriel Valley today who is very proud of her association with her ancestor as well. We have another comment from Joy saying that she was a very talented, she was very talented and brilliant in my opinion. I think in, in the opinion of, of many others, it's unfortunate that often, you know, women's stories such as hers kind of get lost to history. So it's great that the, the family was able to retain her artwork and, and share them with us along with these great letters. Where were these letters found again, uh, Paul? The, the typed versions that you have? They were, they were brought to Los Angeles in 1884 by Elijah Workman, who was the oldest of the, um, of the family here in Los Angeles. And uh, as far as I know, the Krebs family, somebody in the Krebs family still has the originals. So they, they, they apparently do exist. And uh, so hopefully we'll get uh, maybe some good photocopies at some could point. I, could, I, could I just have a quick word about the, the, these letters, Paul? Could I? Of course, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, from my knowledge of English peoples and Irish peoples emigration to the United States in the 19th century. Uh, once uh, the, the emigrant had gone, he'd rather been lost to his homeland. Uh, but that's another aspect in which uh, these workmen people did not uh, disappear into the ether uh, for good. Uh, they kept in touch. Uh, all these letters were gone to and fro, and not only that, but visits were being made as well, as well as replies to letters from Clifton to the United States, uh, as well as letters back and forth across the Atlantic. Uh, a lot of visits were being made uh, by uh, workmen descendants as well. Uh, in 1822, as I mentioned earlier on, remarkably, David, young David, who was only 25 at that time, came back from Missouri uh, to Clifton, across the Atlantic, with all the hazards of that journey, to pick up his younger brother, William, persuade him to be, join him as a partner in the business in Missouri and to collect a lot more cash, <laughs> a lot more capital, which must have helped them in their business as, as saddlers. And that, that, that tendency to cross the Atlantic again uh, by uh, workmen travelers uh, continued con constantly uh, almost throughout the 19th, 20th century. Uh, David's return home in 1822 uh, led on to William's return journey all the way from Los Angeles to Clifton in 1851. An, an astounding journey, journey that must have taken him about six months uh, to get back to Clifton. Uh, that was that 1851 journey by William was followed up by um, Elijah, of course, in in 18, 1879, actually, uh, in 1879, to settle up the, the, the estate at Clifton. Uh, he was followed uh, a few years later by a young man called uh, William Henry Workman, who I think was then in his 20s, but suffering from the after effects of a serious illness. And he was sent uh, on a world cruise uh, by his father, who was William Henry Workman Sr. Uh, the um, mayor of Los Angeles, he was sent on a, on a world cruise uh, for his health to recuperate. And he, he made a point of calling at Clifton. Uh, in 1912, perhaps that was a particularly memorable visit by an American descendant, a workman descendant, 
William Henry, who had been uh, mayor of LA and also city treasurer, I think, uh, returned to Clifton uh, from Los Angeles uh, with his wife and daughter, Mary Julia. And he, he left a very detailed uh, record uh, of his visit, did William Henry, to Clifton, in which he, he said that it was the ambition of a lifetime to see his father's old home at Clifton. His father, it was his lifetime's ambition, and he achieved it in 1912, when he was uh, well in his 70s, not an easy journey even then from uh, Los Angeles to Clifton, but William Henry did it with his wife and daughter, and he achieved a lifetime's ambition to do that. And of course, those, those visits continued with um, uh, the two judges that I mentioned. So when, when the original emigrants left Clifton, the two brothers, David and William, and their sister, uh, Agnes, when they left for the US in the early 1820s, the thread with Clifton certainly was not broken. It continued in letters, return visits, absolutely astonishing and extremely unusual. Again, another facet of this, what I regard as an absolutely extraordinary workman family. They didn't, the Clifton people did not forget uh, the Americans and the Americans did not forget Clifton. <laughs> Remarkable, I think. Anyway, just a little point, a little footnote, if you don't mind. Thank you so much for sharing that, John. That's a, that's a great foot point, uh, footnote for us to, to end on. Thank you guys all so much for joining us today. Also, as a reminder, for those who watched on Zoom, you will be getting an emailed version of uh, the program today, as well as a survey. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind filling that out to let us know how your thoughts on the program. For those that watched on Facebook, if you could please uh, click on the link that I dropped into the comments uh, to fill out the uh, evaluation form there just to let us know what your thoughts are on this pro program and if you have any suggestions of other programs that you might be interested in hearing we would love to hear that um so jason has also said you know it was a very nice presentation today so thank you john thank you paul and thank you everyone for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you at the homestead again very soon yeah, take care thank you thank you thank you both thank you